Happy February! How is your year going so far? Welcome to Crime Dive, the first case of February. My name is Crystal Sky, and if you're anything like me, you can't help but be drawn to true crime cases. So that's what I've decided to talk about. If you also like true crime, and you want to feel better about your makeup skills, because honestly, I just do this to do something on camera, you should absolutely like, subscribe, and let's hang out together every Tuesday where I will take a deep dive look into a true crime case while slapping on the old clown paint. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm actually recording this. Y'all have no idea how crazy everything is right now. It is bananas. Certainly hope I can mitigate uh, the background noise, as you may or may not know. I usually try to film my videos like super late at night because I just live on a very, very busy street. It's also one of those streets that you can cut through like the center of town, you know, so everyone uses it. And things have just been so bonkers. I actually have to record like smack dab in the middle of the day. So yeah, we'll we'll see what I can do. It usually doesn't seem to be a problem. You guys have always said it's not a problem. So, oh, but yeah, I seriously thought that I was just going to have to take the first week of February off because there's just so much going on right now. And the real bonker stuff hasn't even started yet. So yeah, my year has been quite busy so far. Anyway, let's get on to today's case. It is another requested case, which yeah, I got to tell you, I know I've done nothing but requested cases so far this year, but I actually love that I have so many cases suggestions because I've just been so just so busy. It's just hard for me to come up with like cases I want to examine. So thank you so, so much for recommending cases for me. Oh, and by the way, just speaking of recommending uh, cases, I am so sorry. I'm so behind on my comments. I feel so bad. I've just been so busy like editing and researching and doing other stuff for my, my freelancing job. And I just haven't had any time to answer to comments and respond to them. I feel so bad. I'm so sorry. I promise I will catch up with it. I promise. I have been trying, keyword trying there, to at least respond to some comments on, on new videos, like the day I posted. I, again, been trying. So yeah, I'm so sorry, but I hope, you know, I appreciate it so, so much. You guys just leave such sweet comments and they totally make my day. I really don't care about trolly comments because I don't even really read them. Like, honestly, guys, like, honestly, just remember this. Trolls, whether online or in real life, they're really just pathetic losers. They are people who are having a hard time in life. They're miserable and they want everyone else to be miserable too, you know, whether it's a big thing or a small thing, whatever is going on, their lives are obviously not going well. Because who is living a great, happy life and uses their spare time online to like leave trolly comments, you know? So that's why, guys, I know it's hard, but seriously, just ignore trolls both in real life and online, just like these trolls' real life families do. But you know the best thing you can do against trolls? Is just live your best life and just treat them like everyone else in their real life does, like they don't exist. That's my little, that's my little advice for you. Okay, okay, enough talking, let's talk about today's case. Now, this case was actually a cold case for quite a while, you know, it was, it was very cold. It, it happened in 82, and the murderer didn't come to justice in until 2010. Actually, the trial was actually in 2011, but he wasn't arrested by police until 2010. And man, this is definitely a uh, pacing wise, you know, it's definitely a different type of case. Um, I'm going to try to tell it in a little bit more of a different format than I usually do. You know, usually I'll start off with either the perpetrator or the victim and kind of go into their lives. This one, we're just going to plop right in the middle of this case, all right? Because, yeah, that's kind of how I discovered this case. And I'm going to try to to break it down and make it digestible and understandable. Because there's a lot of lying from the perpetrator in this case, and there's a lot of conflicting accounts, it can be confusing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best. Also, I do apologize. There's not a lot of, of photos to go with this case. Not only is this case older, it happened in an extremely small town, Needles, California. We've talked about that town before. So, of course, it's not like the story made, like, national headlines or even statewide headlines, you know what I mean? It was a very localized case. But yeah, I will of course share what I did find and yeah, I'll share a lot of excerpts of like court transcripts and news articles that I found. Today, we will be talking about the case of Jimmy Joe Cox. This was a recommended case to me and it was recommended by, I hope I'm saying your username right, Certified Rodess. 
I hope I'm saying that right. But yeah, they suggested this case to me quite a while ago and said that if I was good at research, I might want to look into this. And man, I found a lot of research. I you know, just said I found like the court documents for this and there was just a lot to go over. Disclaimer wise, we'll be talking about dismemberment, but nothing in graphic detail. And there's a couple of like F-bombs and some swear words. That's pretty much it. So should be okay as far as, you know, gruesomeness and all that is concerned. All right. And I think that is, that is everything. Let's go ahead and get into it, y'all. So, like I said, we're gonna kind of just be dropping right into the middle of this case here, all right? It's gonna be told in a little bit different chronological order, I guess you could say. So, we're gonna open on the date, December 24th, 1982, Christmas Eve. So, it's Christmas Eve, 1982, and nine-year-old Daniel Snow, along with his parents, who were only identified as Mr. and Mrs. Charles Snow, were en route from their home in Littleton, Colorado to California. Guessing they'll probably were visiting family for holidays or something. Now, along the way, they stopped at like a rest stop at the Topic exit that ran along Interstate 40, and it was also right by the Arizona-California border. And it just so happens the Colorado River also ran through this, this rest stop, right? So while Daniel's parents do their thing, Daniel decides to walk along the banks of the Colorado River. And this was on the Arizona side of the Colorado River. I know, doesn't that sound funny? It's the Colorado River, and there's an Arizona side and a California side of it because it runs through the border. And it is walking along the Colorado River, all right, that Daniel would make a horrifying discovery. He stumbled upon a tan plastic bag that was about 12 inches from the shore, like on the bank, and it was wrapped, like, slash tied shut with some black bailing wire. And Daniel, of course, being curious, went ahead and and decided to open the bag and see what was inside. And what he found certainly stunned him. Inside this plastic bag was a severed human hand. He, of course, immediately alerted his parents, who in turn alerted authorities. The Arizona Mojave County Sheriff's Department uh, arrived on scene, and they identified the hand as belonging to either a small child, a woman, or a small man. And they could see that the hand definitely belonged to someone who was Caucasian. But that was about all they could really tell immediately, you know, from just looking at the hand. And the cuts to the bone of the hand were consistent with some sort of, like, power saw. So the sheriff's office then contacted all of the local law enforcement agencies around them, which included California authorities, such as the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office, and the Needles Police Department. And they were seeing if there was any missing persons report or anything like that that would match this hand. You gotta start from somewhere, right? And it's especially difficult when you don't have a whole body, but you just have a hand to go off of, right? So that's what they started with. And on December 26th, the Mojave County officials conducted a search of the area, which included, quote, an extremely low-level air search by a helicopter. And on the 28th, they conducted a mass search, like, along the Colorado River. But despite these searches, no other remains were found. No other remains were found, guys. It was just this hand. Furthermore, as the days went on, no missing persons reports matched the hand, potentially matched the hand. Now, the earliest story of the found severed hand wouldn't hit the local papers until December 30th. Then, around like December 29th, December 30th, like around there, a man walked into the Mojave Valley Sheriff's Office in Arizona, specifically Bullhead City, and he walked in there to report his girlfriend missing. The next day, after reporting to the Arizona authorities, he also walked into the Needles Police Department in California to report the same thing. This man was 43-year-old Jimmy Joe Cox. He was a disabled former railroad brakeman. I don't know why I always stumble over railroad. That is such a hard word for me to say. And he lived with his girlfriend, 24-year-old Carol Jean Spearman. Other reports said that she was 25, so 24, 25. And they lived together in Needles and had lived together for approximately two to three years. Yeah, 43 and a 24, 25-year-old, been together about two or three years. Yeah, disgusting. I really don't understand people, like older adults who like want to get with like young people. It's just, it's disturbing. Like, dude, I'm 36 and the thought of being with even anyone in their 20s like makes me sick to my stomach. Now, Carol, was a custodian at the Santa Fe Medical Clinic in Needles. And she was last seen on December 23rd, 1982 in the company of Jimmy. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of information on Carol. I don't even have her birthday. I tried finding like the find a grave site for her, but there isn't one. She's from North Tonawanda, New York. Her mother is Joy Rowlinson, or maybe it's Rowlinson. R-O-W-L-I-N-S-O-N. And Carol also had a younger sister and her name was Catherine. She would later go by Catherine Axberg. And now I believe 
believe Carol also had other siblings as well, but I don't know anything about that. Like I said, not only was this not a huge story, it was, you know, happened in, in a local area. So it was big in the local area, but this area of, of needles is very small. Carol graduated from North Tonawanda High School. And after that, she left her hometown, quote, seeing the world. And she left New York with a friend. And yeah, they were, they want to go travel the country, guys. They wanted to travel the country and just sort of, you know, explore, enjoy their younger years, you know, before the adulting had to begin. Catherine said of her sister, quote, I think she was just sort of an adventurous spirit. And she left with her friend at the time, and they just had this idea to tour the country. And that's where she ended up, referring to needles. Catherine described Carol as an enthusiastic reader. She loved to read. She was honest and thoughtful, the type of person who, like, never forgot a birthday or anything. Catherine also said that her sister was a craft who made her own jewelry and made Catherine her own like doll furniture for her dollhouse. So yeah, Carol was quite good with her hands. Now, Catherine was only 11 years old when Jimmy would walk into those police departments reporting Carol missing. And she remembered even many years later that the letters her sister would send to her as she was off traveling the country were always signed with quote, I love you immensely and profusely. So even though their ages were pretty far apart, it is said Catherine and Carol were still, you know, really close. And yeah, they, they course responded with a lot of letters back and forth as Carol was out traveling the country. Now, Catherine said that the friend Carol had left New York with had been with Carol when she found herself in Needles, California, but this friend ended up leaving when Carol got with Jimmy, who was 18 years older than her gross, so gross. Blech. Catherine said, quote, she thought he was creepy, I guess. Uh, yeah. So that's really all we know about Carol, all right? So her, her creeper boyfriend reports her missing. So, of course, the authorities start working her case. And now, of course, right, when, when police start working cases, what's the first thing they do? They interview, you know, friends, family, acquaintances, neighbors, people who witnessed the couple, who knew Carol, you know, that, so that's what they started off with. And and the things that neighbors and acquaintances, even Jimmy's own friends said about the couple, certainly made police raise an eyebrow. So Brenda Moffat, she lived near Jimmy and Carol. I'm not sure if she lived right next door or like across the street, but she, she lived very near them. And she told police that she witnessed a pretty bad fight between the couple approximately a little over a year before Carol would disappear. This fight happened in May of 1981. And Brenda told police that, you know, she heard some fighting, so she went to the window and there she saw Carol and Jimmy arguing in the front yard. They were standing next to the car whose front windshield had been broken with a trash can. I'm not sure how Brenda knew that. I'm gonna guess that she saw the smashed in windshield and then maybe the trash can right next to it. Maybe that's what alerted her to the fight. Not sure. There wasn't a lot of very like small details like that. Just that Brenda saw them arguing, saw the crashed windshield, and she said that it had been broken with a trash can. Now, Brenda heard Jimmy say, quote, if you want me to move my fucking stuff out of here, and then she couldn't really hear what he said after that, then Carol responded, but she couldn't hear. But then she heard Jimmy's response, which was, quote, I will get all my shit and leave. Brenda said it is at this point that she saw Jimmy strike a road flare and light it up. Then after he had it lit, he started chasing Carol with it, poking and stabbing her with this lit flare, guys. Brenda, so not only is she witnessing this, she said that Carol's, of course, running trying to, to get help. And Jimmy at one point throws the road flare at Carol. And this was as she ran up the steps of a neighbor's house and pounded on the door asking for help. Not sure if he got her with the road flare when he threw it at her. Now, an officer who responded to this disturbance told investigators who were working Carol's missing persons case that Carol had burns on both sides of the back of her torso and to the back of her neck. All right, so she had some pretty, like, nasty burn wounds. He said that when sulfur drips off of a burning flare, it leaves, like, an irregular pattern. You know, it's just kind of random. However, he saw that Carol's wounds were, like, perfectly round, you know, and, you know, the, the shape and diameter of the actual road flare, which suggested to him that Jimmy had, like, purposely stabbed her with the road flare. You know what I mean? Now, the officer said before obtaining an arrest warrant for Jimmy for this assault, he called him to, you know, see if he would talk. But Jimmy refused to talk to the officer, refused to discuss Carol, and said that he would not come to the door if cops came to his house. He would not talk to them. Jimmy then asked the officer if he had an arrest warrant, and when the 
officer said no, that is when Jimmy hung up and ended the conversation. Another officer, a sergeant, tried to call Jimmy back later, but the line was busy. I think they may have had their arrest warrant at this point. So, since the line was busy, they decided to go to Jimmy and Carol's trailer where they lived, and this was sometime around 8 p.m. So when police arrived at the 10 foot by 37 foot trailer, double wide trailer that Jimmy and Carol shared, they knocked, you know, announcing themselves, but they got no response, no answer. Then, after about 10 minutes of trying to get Jimmy to open the door, they announced that they were just going to break in. And that is when Jimmy came out and they arrested him. Now, I am not sure what happened with this case. I'm not sure if he faced assault charges, if maybe Carol didn't press them. Not sure. I couldn't find any information on what happened when Jimmy was arrested for this physical assault on Carol. So that was just some of the information that police gathered working Carol's missing persons case. And they found out more doing more interviewing. So a friend of Jimmy's, oh, this is interesting. There's like no applicator or anything. That's interesting. Anyway, so a friend of Jimmy's told police that he had last seen the couple on December 23rd, 1982, just a couple of days before Daniel would make his gruesome discovery. And this friend said, yeah, he had last seen Jimmy and Carol on this day, and he remembered it was this day because the power had gone out in needles. This friend said that he ran into the couple at the Sundowner Bar, which was located across the state line in Bermuda City, Arizona. And then, by interviewing witnesses uh, at the bar, they ran into two other witnesses who verified that they did see Jimmy and Carol that night. So this man said him and his cousin had been at the Sundowner Bar that night, and they did see Jimmy and Carol. So this man said that he had seen a woman who looked just like Carol when police showed him the photo of her, looking in the Sundowner parking lot for a ring. This was, I believe, near like closing time. I believe this man said that this was around 1 a.m. So the, the, the bar was getting ready to close up and he saw who he identified as Carol looking for a ring in the parking lot. He said that she was staggering, upset, and was crying, and he thought maybe she was a little intoxicated because he just didn't understand like why she would be so freaked out about a ring. This person said that he saw a man inside a station wagon. It was either red or brown. He couldn't really tell in the dark. It also had tinted windows, and in the station wagon was a man who he would later identify as Jimmy when shown Jimmy's photo. And this man, who I'd, who he identified as Jimmy, was yelling at her. He said this man was screaming at her in a high-pitched voice, slurring his words. We thought maybe the man was a little intoxicated as well. The man called her a bitch, told her he would whip her ass if she didn't find the ring. And this man said that the last thing he heard Jimmy say from inside the station wagon was, quote, hey, bitch, forget the ring. It's over. So that's what this witness remembered. I'm not sure if Jimmy drove off at that point or what. This man's cousin pretty much verified this account. And the cousin said that, uh, yeah, he and the man had actually tried to help Carol find this ring. The cousin said that I believe the man spent, I don't know, like 20 minutes or something helping her look. And then the cousin stayed outside and helped her look for, I think, like an additional like 30-ish minutes. But then I, I don't know if they found the ring or not. There's like conflicting stories with that, but the cousin eventually went back in the bar, and that was the last time they had seen Jimmy or Carol. The cousin said that as he was helping Carol try to find the ring, she said that her boyfriend was going to be very mad if she couldn't find it, and that he would beat her ass if she didn't find it. So it's quite an interesting picture being laid here about Jimmy and Carol's relationship, yeah? Another witness who police interviewed was a bank manager, and at this bank, Carol had a uh, safety deposit box there, and the manager told authorities that the Monday after Christmas on December 27th, Jimmy had come in and told her that Carol was missing. He told this bank manager that him and Carol had had a fight and she had run off. And this bank manager had known Jimmy pretty much her whole life. Like I said, this is a small town where everyone knows everyone. So that could be why Jimmy then asked her if Carol had come into the bank recently. He told her that if Carol had left for good, like this wasn't just a storming off after a fight thing, if he had like actually left her, she would have definitely come and withdrawn what was in her, her safe deposit box. But the bank manager said no, she hadn't been in. And when she told him that, she said that Jimmy started to cry. He told her he had contacted the Needles Police Department to report Carol is missing, but they wouldn't take his report. The bank manager later complained to a friend who worked at the Needles Police Department and was just like, hey man, like what the hell? I ran into my friend Jimmy here and he's saying you guys won't take this missing person's report of his girlfriend. And her friend at the police department said that the reason police didn't really take Jimmy seriously was because they assumed she had run off from a fight because that's what Jimmy had told them. She, like they had a fight and she, she ran off. So they didn't think she was missing, you know? So on January 1st, the Mojave County authorities decided to bring Jimmy in for some questioning. Remember, it's January 1st, so they had the hand, and then they now had this, this report on the radar of a missing woman, and after hearing what Jimmy's own friends and neighbors have said, of course, you know, they were like, well, 
let's look into this a little bit and and interview this boyfriend. So on January 1st, Jimmy reiterated what he had, that him and Carol had had a fight, and that she had run off. He told the deputy in this interview that Carol had a tendency, especially when she was drunk, to run away and disappear for a few days. He told the deputy that this had happened about twice in the last two months, and that every time Carol had left, she had taken her purse with her. And he even described this purse to police. So after this January 1st interview that police had with Jimmy, a close friend of Jimmy's who had known him for a while came to police. He told them that sometime between December 29th of 1982 and January 1st of 1983, he and Jimmy were at the Sundowner Bar and they were talking. Jimmy told him that Carol was gone and she had left behind her purse, car, and failed to pick up her last paycheck at the clinic. Now, Jimmy told this friend when they were chatting at this bar that he didn't report Carol missing because he assumed that she had run off with someone. Jimmy lamented on to this friend how he had been questioned for six to eight hours by authorities and he told his friend that he was suspected of murdering her. So the friend had come to police and told them about this conversation because that's kind of weird, right? Like, we don't even know if this hand is really Carol's. They're just working this missing persons report. And all of a sudden, Jimmy is sitting here talking about like, oh, they think I killed her or whatever. And it's like, what? So I think that's what kind of made this friend go to police and be like, hey, I had this conversation and this is what he said. And when Jimmy found out that this friend had talked to detectives, like he demanded to know like, what's everything you said? What would you say to him? What's exactly everything you said to him? And the friend just told Jimmy like, dude, I told him the truth of what we had in this conversation and I don't want to know anything further. I don't want to be involved in any way, shape or form. Now, though the friend couldn't remember the exact date of this conversation, he knew it had to have been after he was released from jail on a DUI charge. And this was on December 28th and January 3rd when he had left to go back home to Wyoming. And in March, this friend reiterated everything in another interview over the phone because he was in Wyoming. Another friend of Jimmy's, again, these are all friends of Jimmy's guys. Like some of these people had known Jimmy his whole life. Other ones were described as being very close friends. So another friend of Jimmy came to police and said that around 9 a.m. on December 24th, Christmas Eve, he was driving north on Highway 95 and he was specifically between Five Mile Road and the Needles Dump when he saw Jimmy on the side of the road in his station wagon. He was standing next to it. It was parked on the side of the road and this friend, you know, waved and acknowledged to Jimmy who in turn waved and acknowledged him back. Now this is an especially important detail, so keep that in your thinking caps. Now, a neighbor who lived right next door to Jimmy also told police that about three to five days before this neighbor discovered Carol was missing was early on either a Sunday or a Wednesday. Those are just random days to remember in your head. I don't know why he said it was either a Sunday or a Wednesday, but he saw Jimmy scrubbing the inside of Carol's car. He had a brush and soapy water and was rinsing it out with a garden hose. And he was like really thoroughly scrubbing it. And this neighbor had never before seen Jimmy do anything like this. So this stood out to him, you know? Another neighbor who also lived nearby, Hiram Wilson, said that during the Christmas break, it was the Christmas school break, he saw someone who looked an awful lot like Jimmy scrubbing out the inside side of Jimmy's station wagon. He was vigorously scrubbing like the back seats with, again, like a brush and soapy water. Hiram saw they had this like giant, like 14 gallon bucket of something. And Jimmy was really going to town trying to scrub it up. And he had never before seen Jimmy do this. Um, never really seen anyone do this on the inside of the car. And this really stood out to Hiram. And he said it stood out even more because Jimmy did not touch the exterior of his car, which was like dusty and kind of dirty. You know, you're living in the desert. It's going to be dusty. And he thought that was really odd that Jimmy was was so vigorously scrubbing the inside of a station wagon, but not the exterior. He didn't touch it. Hiram also said that it was either right before or right after he witnessed this. He couldn't quite remember, but he heard the sound of power tools coming from Jimmy's home. Again, which was not a common occurrence. So it stood out to him. And Hiram said it was right after these incidents that he noticed he never saw Carol again. Now, after hearing all of this that I've just laid out for you, cops, of course, decided to bring Jimmy in for for more thorough questioning, more of an interrogation. And this was on January 5th. Remember, they had found this hand like... What would that be like? I don't know, like two weeks or something now? They found it on Christmas Eve. At this point on January 5th, when they're interrogating Jimmy, they still did not have an ID to that severed hand. So they brought Jimmy in for, yeah, more thorough questioning, aka an interrogation. Jimmy told them that he had last seen Carol either the Wednesday prior to Christmas or Thursday, December 23rd. I believe he kept flip-flopping on those days, whether it was the 22nd or the 23rd of when he had last seen her. Jimmy said Carol was, quote, fallen down drunk within 30 minutes of arriving at the San 
and Sundowner Bar. He told officers that he had driven them there in his red station wagon, that they had gone to another bar before this and had consumed about two to three drinks, and that Carol had downed about one to two straight shots of liquor along with every screwdriver she consumed at the bar. And he said that's why she was so drunk so early. He said he took her home between 7 and 9 p.m., undressed her and put her to bed, and assumed that she would wake up to her alarm at 5 a.m. Now, the report that I read this, this interrogation about said that Jimmy also, quote, variously said that Carol actually slept on the floor in the trailer, that when she had gotten home, she had just sort of like, yeah, stumbled and passed out like on the floor in front of the couch or whatever. So I think those were uh, more details that he kept kind of switching about. Oh, no, I put her to bed. Oh, no, she just passed out drunk when we got home. He said that when he woke up, Carol was gone, as was her purse. He said, again, the report said, quote, variously, that he went looking for Carol at her work at the clinic, and he contacted his sister, Nancy Cusick, who worked at the clinic with Carol and knew her. Nancy told her brother that Carol had not been into work, and so Jimmy told police that is when he went, then went to Carol's best friend's house. Apparently, he had found her there before, crashing on her friend's couch, so she was like, alright, she's not at work, so I'll, I'll go to her best friend's house and see if she's there. And of course, as we know, she was not there. So when police asked Jimmy, like, hey, when did you first report Carol is missing? He said in part, quote, I don't know how long it's been, and she's run away before. We've had disagreements, and she's run away. She's hitchhiked. She's gone off with other men. She was not the most faithful, moral person in the world. Just just keep in mind everything that Jimmy is saying here, all right, guys? He told police that Carol had run off approximately four to six times before, I think in the course of their relationship, and he said on one of these occasions, approximately six months prior to her disappearance, she had come home and told Jimmy that she had been with another man. He also stated at different times in this interrogation that he thought Carol had run off with another man and or had run off to New York to be with her family. He told police that her mom wanted her to come home for Christmas and Jimmy didn't want to go. And so he thought maybe that's where Carol was. Jimmy told police that a friend who lives on the Arizona side of the Colorado River called him on January 1st, alerting him to the article about the found hand. Jimmy told police that he immediately went out, got a copy of the paper, and then went to the Needles Police Department. He said a detective there spoke with him, made a copy of the article, and also suggested that Jimmy go speak with the sheriff office in Bullhead City, Arizona. I think it might be because that's where like the hand was found on the Arizona side and whatnot. So they were sort of like taking charge of the investigation. So the detective at the Neils Police Department, yeah, pointed, pointed Jimmy in that direction. Be like, you should go visit them as well. At Bullhead City, Jimmy apparently handed over a poem that Carol had written. He claimed that she had written it before she had disappeared. Supposedly like a couple days before she disappeared. Like it was supposedly written like not long before she would disappear. I feel like I just said disappear a lot in a row. And we will get a little bit into this poem in just a moment. Jimmy had this poem in his wallet and yeah, he handed it over to authorities. He also informed them that Carol had previously been arrested in 1976 in Bakersfield, as well as having dental work done in needles. And he referenced the article with the found severed hand as to why he was now reporting his girlfriend missing and cited, you know, how she had run away before and all that. And I can't remember, did I say it was the Mojave County officers in Arizona that was interrogating Jimmy? If so, that was incorrect. It was the needles Police Department. This case had multiple departments working with it, so it was kind of hard to to get things straight. So Jimmy told police that he had returned to the sheriff's office four times before this January 5th interrogation. And every time, Jimmy claimed that he talked to someone different who had no idea what he was talking about. He said he'd been all over town, quote, for two weeks, talking to neighbors, employees of like the local bars, casinos, restaurants, anywhere and anyone that he could think of, he claimed he had talked to to see if they had seen Carol and no one had. He said, quote, it took two weeks for any law enforcement agency to ask anybody any questions, implying of course that he had reported Carol missing for about two weeks and nothing was ever done. Now, this is kind of, like I said, there, there's some confusing parts with this case because there's just not a lot of information out there. So you can really only go by the documents that are out there. And some of them are just, I don't know if they're missing information or if they're contradictory or what, but all, all this document said that during this interrogation, right? So when Jimmy is explaining all this, a lieutenant who was sitting in on this interrogation told Jimmy that he had talked to, quote, damn near everybody at the sheriff's office in Bullhead City, Arizona, and quote, everybody says they never talked to Jimmy. So I was a little confused. And that's because there was a sheriff's deputy from Mojave County, Arizona, who later said that Jimmy did come to them. A deputy sheriff of the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office in California would also later reveal that Jimmy had walked into their offices on January 1st 
with the article about the severed hand. And this deputy said that Jimmy had asked him about fingerprints and asked like, hey, the severed hand, can they take fingerprints from this hand and use it to identify them? And the deputy, of course, then said, well, you know, if someone had fingerprints on record, we could certainly compare. However, if there were no prior, you know, existing prints, then there would probably be no way to, you know, find out who this hand belonged to. Remember, guys, this is like 82, 83. DNA was not a thing. Not that it didn't exist. That sounded kind of funny. It wasn't a thing. It wasn't like a technology that was yet used or discovered. And it was at this point, as the deputy was explaining about fingerprint, you know, analysis and stuff, that Jimmy had told the deputy he had awoken on December 23rd to find that his girlfriend was missing and that he had last seen her when they had gone to bed the night previously around 9 p.m. And he was scared that the hand found could be that of Carol. And he did not tell the San Bernardino deputy about Carol's arrest in Bakersfield or anything like that. But that could be due to the fact that the deputy told Jimmy that he himself could not take this missing persons report and that he would have to go and file a missing persons report with the Needles Police Department because that is where she lived. And Jimmy reiterated, well, he hadn't done that yet because Carol had supposedly left, quote, for weeks on end sometimes. And apparently... Jimmy had also gone here because I guess back in this time in 1983, the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office had jurisdiction in all of the unincorporated areas of Needles, California, whereas the Needles Police Department had jurisdiction within like everything within like the city itself. So I, I wonder if that's why Jimmy went here. Additionally, this deputy also referred Jimmy over to the Mojave County authorities in Arizona because it was, quote, the primary agency investigating the incident. Because of course, that is where the hand had been found on the Arizona side of the river. So that, that's what Jimmy is telling his police, right? But, um, you know this friend that supposedly pointed him to this article about the severed hand? This friend had a different recollection of events. So this friend told police they had read the article about the severed hand and Jimmy had come over to his house either later that same day that the article was published or a couple of days after the fact. He couldn't quite remember when. But when Jimmy had come over during a, a conversation, this friend said that he brought up like the severed hand, you know, the article he'd found to Jimmy. And Jimmy had told him in a very like nonchalant, unconcerned manner that Carol had been missing for about a week. Now, of course, alarmed, this friend told Jimmy like, oh my, you need to go to the authorities. She's missing for a week. Like, bro, what? And I think at this point, Jimmy had reported her missing, but he didn't tell this friend that for some reason. And this friend said Jimmy just seemed really nonchalant and unsurprised about like the finding of the severed hand. And he seemed almost unconcerned with it when his friend tried to talk to him about it. This friend also told police that it was either that same day or on an earlier occasion, he had seen a box for a circular saw in the backseat of Carol's car. Jimmy had driven it to this friend's house. So there's there's one contradiction, all right? So yeah, Jimmy said this, but this friend is saying like, no, 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 this, this is how this went down. So that's kind of odd, right? Um, I've said this before, I don't know about y'all, but when people start changing their stories, especially when it's like small details that seem kind of insignificant, that definitely makes me raise an eyebrow, right? So when police ask Jimmy about that flare incident, the road flare incident, you know, where he chased Carol and burned her with it, Jimmy also had a different recollection than Brenda's. He said that he had found Carol with another man and that was why he chased her with it, quote, to scare the shit out of her. He said the slag from the flare, quote, was slung while he was running and it went through the back of her shirt and burned her accidentally. And referencing what that friend said about seeing Jimmy on that highway between Five Mile Road and the dump, Jimmy said there was no way to access the Colorado River via that Five Mile Road. Apparently that Five Mile Road was a pretty like commonly traversed local road. And because probably because that friend said that he had seen Jimmy like the day that the hand was found on that road, they asked Jimmy, yeah, like, hey, can you access the Colorado River via that Five Mile Road? And Jimmy said no. But they knew that that was a lie. You actually could access it. It just wasn't, I guess... I don't know, according to Jimmy, it wasn't like the best way to go. That it was like going out of one's way and you'd have to go through like some brush and like a little bit of like thick bushes and stuff to get to it. But he finally did admit that yes, in theory, if one wanted to access the Colorado River via Five Mile Road, you could. So not convinced of anything Jimmy was telling them and probably because of like just all of the inconsistencies and the conflicting reports between what Jimmy was saying versus what his neighbors, friends, and other officers were saying, police arrested Jimmy that same day, January 5th, under suspicion of homicide. And of course, once they have him arrested, police are wondering like, hey, do we have an identity to this hand? Could it be Carol? And the next day on Thursday, January 6th, 1983, they were able to confirm that that hand, unfortunately, did belong to Carol. Apparently the Mojave officials in Arizona were able to confirm it via those fingerprints that Bakersfield, California had on file from when Carol was arrested. Now, though authorities believed that they did have the identity to this hand, I don't think they wanted 
wanted to like release that information to the media or something. So instead, when the police broke this news to the media, like, hey, we think we have an identity to the severed hand, they also told media that they were still actively looking for Carol as a missing person. Quote, I have no authority to say she is dead, but the matter is being investigated as a homicide. And this was according to Mojave County Sheriff's Deputy Pat Mullen. That's what he told media. And... Remember, at this point in time, since we're in the 80s, the only way to, like, really confirm an identity was through fingerprints and or dental records. DNA was not in use yet. So when this made the, the local news rounds that Jimmy was being arrested on the suspicion of murdering Carol, his sister Nancy spoke to media trying to defend her brother. She told local news outlets that her brother and Carol had gone home together the night of December 23rd, and after Jimmy had fallen asleep, Carol had just walked out of the home. Nancy said, quote, She had set the alarm for the next morning, and when he referring to Jimmy, got up, she was not there. She had done that once or twice before. She'd get drunk and get moody and go for a walk. She just liked to get out and be alone. Nancy told media that it was her brother who had alerted authorities to Carol's disappearance and had told them where to find Carol's fingerprints. And she repeated the story that Jimmy had seen the story of the severed hand, and that is why he had gone to authorities. See, so yeah, I mean, we're talking about like a small town. So of course, this, you know, this news quickly made the rounds in, in the local community, you know? So I think Nancy was trying to do damage control, I'm, I'm guessing. So while Jimmy was in custody, police also obtained a search warrant to search him and Carol's trailer, along with Jimmy's car and a boat he owned. Needles police detective Robert Rodriguez told media, quote, we're working on some leads that we came upon. I can't divulge what we have as of yet, Yet, it might jeopardize the case. And in the meantime, of course, authorities were still looking for Carol, even though they told the media they were looking, you know, still actively looking for her. They were treating it like a homicide and pretty much trying to find her body at that point, you know. I'm not sure why they said that to media about like, oh, well, we think it's her hand, but we're still actively looking for her. So on January 7th, the search warrant for Jimmy and Carol's trailer and Jimmy's car and boat was executed. They noted the trailer was exceptionally clean. They found mail that was addressed to Jimmy over open and laying on the table, whereas mail that was addressed to Carol was unopened and in the trash. They also noticed stains on the bed sheets, the mattress pad, and the mattress itself, which later would test positively for the presence of blood. And much, much later, when technology allowed, they would later find that that blood was typed A, and Jimmy and Carol both had type A blood. The stain on the mattress was noted to be of a significant amount, consistent with uh, a major nosebleed, is what they saw. In the shed, they found several wrapped Christmas presents for Carol, most of them from Jimmy. A brush hoe was found on the exterior side of the shed, I think leaning against it, and it had traces of human blood on the blade edge. Unfortunately, technology at this time could not test this blood because the sample was just too small. A spool of black baling wire was also found in the shed, and it matched the diameter and composition of the baling wire that was found in the bag that contained the severed hand. In the backseat of Jimmy's car, police found a somewhat new-looking box for a circular saw. However, the saw in question that went in this box would never be found. They didn't find it in the shed or in the trailer or in the car. It was just gone. While they were searching, police also noticed long scratches on the exterior of Jimmy's car, like on the sides of it. It was long scratches as if you were driving through some very thick brush. Remember what we said earlier? If you were going to access the Colorado River via five mile road, you'd have to go through some heavy desert brush. So I think that's why that stood out to cops as they were searching. What also stood out to them was just how clean the interior of Jimmy's car was, especially compared to the outside, which was like dusty and stuff. I mean, like I said, it's the desert. Your car's going to be dusty. But they did, like, it was just a very stark difference. They noticed the back seat had been reupholstered and reupholstered quite recently because it was so new looking, you know, and nice looking. In the trunk, they found three latex gloves and a box slash roll of tan plastic garbage bags, which were the same ones that the severed hand was found in. But despite, despite all this, all right, despite the hearsay, despite the circumstantial, like, eyebrow raising stuff that they found at Jimmy and Carol's trailer and in his car, authorities had no concrete evidence linking Jimmy to Carol's disappearance and subsequent murder. So Jimmy was eventually let go. I wasn't too sure on how long he had been held in custody. I know he was arrested January 5th, and I think he may have been in jail behind bars for a couple weeks because he was held without bond. But with no concrete evidence, they were forced to let him go. And then, on January 23rd, 1983, there were two boys playing on the Arizona side 
side of the Colorado River, near Topic and the Golden Shores Marina, and they were 200 yards from where Carol's hand had been found by Daniel about a month earlier. And, much like Daniel had done, the two boys made a horrifying discovery. Although I would argue that these boys' discovery, much more horrific than Daniel's, which was already pretty gruesome. So the boys, one of whom was only 12 years old, had stumbled upon two plastic bags, one inside of the other, you know, and they were tied shut with black bailing wire. And the boys discovered this approximately around like 4.30, 5pm. It was somewhere around there, late afternoon slash early evening. The outer bag was a tan plastic garbage bag, and inside of that was a green bag. And inside the green bag was a severed human head a woman's head with long hair. When the boys had grabbed the bag from the river, because it was just sort of like floating there on the bank, so they had hoisted it up and like lifted it on the shore. And as soon as they saw the woman's face in the bag, they immediately had took off and alerted their parents. And I think one of the boys' father then alerted the owner of the Golden Shores Marina, who then contacted authorities. It took the police about an hour and a half to arrive to the scene. And they noticed that the head had been severed from the back at the base of the neck with an instrument that cut midway way to the jaw, or in the jaw rather, then veered upward, then backed up, and recut about a half inch removed. After a forensic anthropologist was consulted, the investigation then centered on some sort of handheld saw. They could tell that th this had been cut with some sort of power saw tool. They also found a fingerprint on one of the folds of the garbage bag. It was a partial, but it could never be identified. It was actually tested against every officer who was on scene and Jimmy, but they could never match it. And that was because the print w was partial. And of course, when this broke in the local news media, police hadn't yet like 100% identified the head of as that of Carol, even though that was sort of the assumption of everybody. And they told media, quote, we are basically sure it is Spearman's head, but until the coroner makes a positive identification, there will be no speculation. And this was according to Sheriff Bill Richardson. And by January 27th, the head was unfortunately confirmed to be that of Carol. I believe they matched her dental records from New now, authorities said when they had searched that area like a month ago when Daniel had found the hand that they did not find any trace of any other remains. Like it was really weird because people were like, wait a minute, this head was found 200 yards from where the hand was? How could cops not find anything? Because remember, they searched that area. But yeah, authorities came out and said like, no, nah, my dudes, like we searched this area. There was nothing, nothing here. And they said her head, quote, was not in the vicinity when we searched. And the area where the boys found this head is apparently like a pretty well-trafficked area, like of the marina. And that's why people were just so astounded that cops hadn't found anything. Because apparently, yeah, this was a pretty well-trafficked little area. And it just seemed unfathomable that they wouldn't be able to find any other remains, you know? Especially when the head is then found a month later, 200 yards from when the hand was, right? An even bigger mystery was where the rest of Carol's body was. Quote, it's a mystery. There's no two ways about it. Police then conducted another intensive search of that area that included 60 officers. And they even had divers go into the river to search for any other remains. And they had some stuff working for them, like the river's level was going to be lowered. So that was going to aid police in their search. However, I guess cold weather and like muddy waters still proved an obstacle. And still... Nothing else was ever found of Carol, guys. Her hand and head would be the only things ever recovered. And it is after this, the discovery of Carol's head, that her case just turned cold. There was nothing else. Isn't that incredible? In February of 1983, so, you know, after the head had been found, but nothing else, Jimmy wrote a letter to Carol's mom, Joy, who was, you know, still in, in New York. And in it, he said, in part, quote, in spite of her faults, Carol was and still is number one with me. She could never do anything so bad that I wouldn't forgive her. And she knew it. She could have come home any time, the 22nd or 23rd, and told me any kind of a story or excuse, and she would be alive today. Joy would later reveal that Jimmy had actually actually written her a letter before this. It was dated December 30th, 1982, and had been mailed on the 31st. And in the letter, Jimmy said that he was enclosing a copy of a poem that Carol had written right before she disappeared, that Carol had, quote, left for him when she left. And while he said that it was written, like, not too long before she disappeared, he said that he knew that she couldn't have written it, like, the night she disappeared because she was, quote, too drunk. He went on in the letter, quote, so I guess she had planned this move ahead of time. Apparently she had someone pick her up. He said if Carol wasn't with Joy or her older sister in New York, then she was probably in Nevada being a sex worker. He said that Carol had discussed 
discussed this with him previously. He then went on to describe what he said was, quote, the main trouble with Carol and him, and that was he loved her too much. And, quote, when she began to stay out all night, he, quote, would always let her come home and accept her lame excuses for being gone, even though he knew better. You knew better? That's why you're a 40-year-old trying to screw like a 21-year-old? Bite me. He continued, quote, Then she began to stay out two or three nights until the spring of this year when she stayed out for two weeks. He said Carol had lost all respect for him and he felt like a fool as he, quote, worshipped the ground she walked on. He also said in this letter that Carol's best friend had supposedly told him that Carol had grown an interest in a, quote, blonde mailman. And he encouraged Joy in this letter to contact Carol's best friend in the hopes that this best friend would disclose Carol's location to Joy, who could then relay that information to Jimmy. And he close the letter saying that if he did not hear from Joy or Catherine, he was going to go to the police and quote, turn Carol in missing. The audacity of these people, like this fool, what a simp, dude, what a simp. Oh, I worship the ground she walked on. No, you're a disgusting predator who was like some 40 some old dude with like an early 20 year old. You're disgusting. Carol probably wised up is what happens. That's usually what happens, right? Is these chicks usually, you know, as they get older, they see like, oh no, you're a creeper. Or you're a loser. That's why you went after me when I was young and naive. Maybe that's what happened. I don't know. I just, I read those parts of that letter that he sent her mom and I'm just like, oh my God, what a simp. Yeah, I just couldn't believe that letter. Like, I don't know. So let's get a little bit into this poem that Carol had written, supposedly for Jimmy, right before she disappeared. Let's get a little bit more into that. So in the poem that she wrote, it speaks about someone who doesn't listen to her, does not value her or her thoughts or her opinions. Yeah, that is why these creepers will t- specifically target naive young women, right? It speaks about her and this person not getting along, how they're always arguing, always disagreeing, never communicating, that, quote, all the joy has turned to pain, that things can't remain as they are, that this person may her feel insignificant and the person is quote fading out of you and it concludes quote and now it seems it's all been said I must leave so I'll go ahead and this was supposedly I believe this was also the same poem that Jimmy had given police he had given Joy I think he had written Joy like a copy of the poem or copied it or something because he gave the original to police and Joy said when she got these letters from Jimmy she never believed anything he said and she quote was pretty sure Jimmy had killed her daughter Carol so when she got this letter in February she did alert the Mojave County County sheriffs in Arizona about this letter that Jimmy had written her and just telling them everything she knew about her daughter and this older man's relationship. Everything that she knew anyway, which wasn't a whole lot. She said at one point after Carol had disappeared, Jimmy had told her Carol was going to leave him and that she had come to Needles with nothing but a backpack and she could leave the same way. Jimmy told Joy that the couple frequently fought over Carol's drinking, that Carol used every drug she could get her hands on, but he just loved Carol too much to kick her out. He told Jimmy joy that Carol could pretty much do anything and he would forgive her and that she had left him before on previous occasions, but he didn't know why like this time it was so different. She also told authorities that Jimmy had told her that he would kill himself if it turned out the hand was Carol's. But in a letter dated after the hand had been identified, Jimmy took that back and said, well, I can't kill myself because my mom would have a heart attack and then my sister would try to kill herself. And Jimmy also, for some reason, told Joy that Carol had told him that if he had ever hit her, she would wait until he was asleep and attack him with a frying pan. Now, during a phone conversation between Jimmy and Joy, she straight up asked him if he had killed her daughter. And after a six to eight second silence, Jimmy responded, quote, Carol was no good. You know that, don't you? Just like Catherine. Joy also said one of the last times she spoke with her daughter before Christmas, she had begged her to come home to New York, even offering to give her the fare to come there. Like she really wanted to see her daughter. But she said Carol told her that she couldn't and that she was very sad and depressed. And that was the last time her mother had spoken with her. Additionally, Joy also told authorities that she had received a letter from Jimmy notifying her of Carol's disappearance slash that like she left him before December 25th, Christmas. She had received this letter saying Carol was missing and was going to leave him and she had received it before Christmas. And she said just all these letters from Jimmy was very odd because in the two to three years that they had been together, Jimmy had never once contacted her or written to her, let alone like vent about the relationship problems between her and her daughter. So she found it all very, very odd. And because Needles is, you know, I've said this a couple times now, a very small, close-knit, tight community. There are many rumors swirling about like what could have possibly happened to Carol. And because, you know, she was dismembered and we are 
are in the 80s, so satanic panic is all the rage at this point. There were fears that, like, her death could have been attributed to some sort of cult. Mojave County Sheriff's Detective Don Geary said, quote, possible cult involvement had been an integral part of the investigation into Carol's murder. Although he said in an article that was a year after Carol's head had been found, that that was no longer the primary element that they are investigating in the case. Quote, I am not ruling out the possibility of more than one individual being involved. Mojave County Sheriff's Office Chief of Detectives Dale Lent said, quote, there's a lot of fear connected with this, and it is a good psychological ploy to generate fear in potential witnesses. However, in the same article, officials stated that though there were other suspects in the case, they were focusing their primary resources on one individual, who they of course refused to name. And since authorities didn't even know where exactly Carol had been killed, I mentioned this earlier, the investigation was a cooperative one. And it was a cooperative one between the Needles Police Department in California and the Mojave County Sheriff's Office in Arizona. Although they did suspect Carol had been murdered, like, in her hometown of Needles, but yeah, they had no way to determine that. So that is why it was a cooperative one between the police department of the town that she lived in and the police department of where her remains were found. An even bigger hurdle was they didn't even know how Carol had died. The pathologist wasn't able to determine a cause of death. Her head had no noticeable wounds, you know, gunshots, stab wounds, anything. It had nothing. And all they had was her head and her hand. I think they said it was her left hand. But yeah, without any noticeable wounds on either of those remains, there was no way to determine how she had even been killed. Now, by 1986, Carol's case was pretty much dead in the water. It had gone stone cold. And in an article about the case in 1986, Mojave County Sheriff's Detective Clint Fairless talked about how he worked the, quote, bizarre case for two years. At the time of this article, he was working at the Needles Police Department, and he spoke about how Carol's case was was the one that stuck with him. You know, you hear that with law enforcement officials. They have that one case that always stuck with them. Carol's was Fairless's. Quote, I think about it all the time. What might have happened? What did happen? There are people who know, but because of fear or whatever, they won't come forward. We have had several anonymous calls over the past three or four years, but nobody has been willing to come forward. Until they do, the Spearman case will most likely stay right where it's at. We've hit a dead end. Mojave County Sheriff's Detective Steve Garibay was in charge of the case at this point and said the cult aspect, quote, is still a consideration in our investigation. There are always rumors. In the late 70s, there were cattle mutilations all over the state. There were a couple in Kingman. We are not ruling out the possibility that this is something similar. Though he said the chances of solving the case were, quote, a long shot. He also believed, quote, someone's conscience is screaming. Soon, somebody is going to leak enough that we'll be able to reopen this case. And then three years after this 1986 article in 1989, the Needles Police Department was dissolved. And I believe it was d- absorbed by the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office. And Carol's case then sat on a shelf collecting dust for 27 years before in 2009, it was finally reopened by the San Bernardino County Cold Case Unit. And they reopened her case, went over all the original files, did, you know, re-interview of witnesses. They had even found witnesses that had not been originally interviewed and who should have. And they worked the case for about a year to a year and a half. And finally, on Wednesday, May 12th, 2010, authorities were able to arrest Jimmy once again for Carol's homicide. He was 71 years old at this point, And they also searched his home. In his bedroom, they found a photo album that had about like 20 plus articles about Carol's disappearance. And it was in his bedroom. They also found a circular saw in one of three sheds that Jimmy owned, but it of course did not match the one that went to the box that was found in his station wagon back in the 80s. Now, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Detective David Johnson was the one who interrogated Jimmy, who told the detective that on December 23rd, 1982, he went to a tavern across the Colorado River in Arizona and later returned home with Carol, who he said was extremely intoxicated. He repeated the same story as before. They laid her down, had gone to bed himself, and when he awoke in the morning, she was gone. He said the power had gone off in needles when they had gone to the Sundowner Bar, and it was around 4 or 5 p.m. He said, they had a couple of drinks over the course of a couple hours. Yep, he's contradicting himself. Remember, he said Carol was falling down drunk within 30 minutes, but now he's saying, oh no, 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 we enjoyed a couple drinks over the course of a few hours. 
He said him and Carol left the bar, went back home to Needles when the power was on, and they had gone to bed together that night. And when he awoke in the morning around 6 or 7 a.m., he found that she was gone. He said he either went to Carol's best friend's house or called her, he couldn't remember, but Carol was not there. He told Detective Johnson that it wasn't like Carol to just walk off, contradicting what he had been telling police and even Carol's mother, right? He said that they had briefly separated for about a month, during which time she may have had a relationship with someone else. But other than that, she was, quote, devoted to him. And she would just never up and leave like that. He also said, due to the fact that Carol had been sexually assaulted in her past, she would have never gotten to a car with a stranger. Again, contradicting himself, remember, he said that she was a hitchhiker. He denied Carol had any other affairs while they were living together in Needles, other than the men that she had dated before him, of course. When asked if there had been any physical altercations between them, Jimmy said no, they had their problems like any other couple, but other than that, everything was fine and dandy. There was nothing ever major or violent in their relationship. But when officers reminded him of that road flare incident of 1981, all of a sudden, you know, Jimmy was like, oh, well, you know what? On second thought, yeah, I guess there was that one time. He gave yet another version of this event, saying Carol had been drinking, that they had gotten into an argument. So Carol had then left and driven to a friend's house. And according to Jimmy, he said that he went to Carol's friend's house to get Carol's keys from her so she couldn't drive drunk. I accidentally put the wrong falsy on the wrong eye. Whoopsie. Anyway, Jimmy said when he got to Carol's friend's house, some sort of confrontation ensued between Jimmy and Carol. And he claimed Carol started, quote, showing off in front of her friends and refused to hand over her keys. And Jimmy said that is when he got the flare, lit it, and began chasing Carol around the yard with it. He said slag from the fire had splashed onto the backs of Carol's legs and on her back, which burned her. And he told Detective Johnson that he only did this in order to scare Carol and scare her into handing over her keys. He was just doing it for her own good guys. Now, when Detective Johnson brought up Jimmy's conflicting testimony from 1983, when he had a completely different version of this road flare incident, Jimmy didn't deny making these statements and just kind of threw up his hands is like, oh, well, the record says I said that, then I guess I did. Her, her, her. And he offered no further explanation for the discrepancies between his two stories of this road flare incident. Jimmy also denied that this ring incident that happened in the parking lot of the Sundowner Bar didn't happen at all. Remember, there was that man and his cousin who said that a drunk Carol was trying to find a ring and Jimmy was yelling at her? Yeah, Jimmy said that this didn't happen at all. He said nothing at all unusual happened the night before she disappeared. And he said he and Carol did not argue that day. He said Carol did not have a ring and he never gave her one, quote, he thought. He said that they never screamed at each other. But when, you know, Detective Johnson pointed out the road flare incident is like, well, I mean, we have at least one instance of you guys yelling and screaming and fighting with each other. Jimmy conceded, well, I mean, yeah, I guess Carol probably yelled at me during that. I mean, so yeah, you've got that one. He told Detective Johnson that when Carol disappeared, her car was home, but her keys were missing. And he wasn't sure if her purse was gone or not now because she had so many. So now he's saying that he's not sure if she took her purse with her. Jimmy said that he had found the story himself of the severed hand in the Mojave Valley newspaper, and he had gone to the sheriff's office, he didn't specify which one, to give more information about Carol, and that he had previously reported her missing. So now he's changing that detail as well. He told Detective Johnson that he was instead arrested when he went to the police department. Yeah, see what I mean about like this case is kind of confusing to research, because you've got Jimmy just saying all kinds of stuff, like so many conflicting reports with Jimmy. When Detective Johnson asked Jimmy why he had waited so long to report Carol missing, Jimmy, again, conflicting his own words, said that he assumed Carol would just be gone for a day or two and then would just show up or call. He said, though she had a history of hitchhiking and moving around, she was actually a homebody. And she stayed at home most of the time, even though... As we just said, he said that she would have never gotten to a car with a stranger and wouldn't hitchhike and stuff. And he also said that when she left, she had never left for more than like overnight. And it's like, well, then why wait so long to report her missing, dummy? It's so amazing, these people. They think they're so clever. And it's like, bro, like, because you're telling lies, though, like you've got conflicting stories. We've got other stuff that pokes a hole in this lie. Oh, whoops. Now I got to make up another lie. It's like, dude, during the interrogation, Jimmy also said that he couldn't exclude anybody as characters. Carol's murderer. Which I guess this made Detective Johnson sort of raise an eyebrow. I guess in his experience, most people attempt to exclude themselves as the perpetrator or something. And so yeah, this comment just sort of rubbed him the wrong way. And when the detective asked Jimmy about the fact that Carol was dismembered, you know, like, what do you think of that? Like, why would someone do that? You know, how they sort of just try to get him to talk. Jimmy said he didn't know why anyone would do that, quote, after she was shot, that someone must have hated her to, quote, put a bullet in her. Although he had asserted earlier she had no enemies. And of course, this immediately made Detective Johnson perk up because remember, they didn't know how Carol had 
had died. And all of a sudden you have Jimmy talking about like bullets and shooting someone. Jimmy also went on and said that it made no sense to him that if Carol were sexually assaulted, they would have to kill her. Which was just kind of odd, right? Like, we don't know anything about sexual assault. Like, we just have her head in her hand. So, like, all of a sudden, he's talking about, like, sexual assault? What? He asserted that whoever had dismembered Carol was not trying to hide her identity. Otherwise, they wouldn't have wrapped her hand and head in plastic and put them in the river, which they would undoubtedly float and be found. He felt that the murderer was just trying to shock someone with this. He explained away the bloodstains found on, like, the mattress and the sheets and stuff in his trailer. And I guess he had, he changed his story a couple times with this. First, he tried to say that the blood was from Carol's period. And when I, it was pointed out, like, there's no way she would have lost that much blood during her period. He then pivoted and said that like, oh, well, the mattress and all that, it was actually in the trailer when I already purchased it. It was already there, implying that like it was already pre-stained. Who the hell uses a used bed with noticeable stains on it? Like, come on, dude, what a lame excuse. He also tried to explain away that bizarre February 1983 letter he had written to Joy, Carol's mother. He said he wrote it to tell her family how he felt felt about her disappearance. He said the circular saw that went in the box that they had found in his station wagon was in the shed. It was in the shed. And that police quote must have missed it when they searched it in the 80s. Okay. Considering that was like specifically something they were searching for, I find that hard to believe. It just seemed like Jimmy had an explanation for everything. However, when Detective Johnson asked Jimmy if he had ever significantly injured himself with his brush hoe, causing him to bleed on it, Jimmy said no. That had never happened. And I believe that is when Detective Johnson revealed that they had actually found human DNA on that brush hoe blade. And it said Jimmy seemed very, like, startled and surprised. Like, this came out of left field, and he was he was very shook up about this news. And he couldn't explain how blood could have gotten there. Jimmy ended up having a hearing in July of 2010, where a judge would decide if authorities now had enough evidence to bring Jimmy to trial. At this two-day hearing, everyone testified, many reiterating what they had back in 1983. The man who was with his his cousin and who had seen Carol, you know, the night that disappeared with the ring incident in the parking lot. He was shown Carol's picture in 2009 slash 2010 when the cold case unit was reworking her case. And he once again identified her as being the woman he had seen in the parking lot. He reiterated pretty much what he had in the 80s, that she seemed maybe a little more intoxicated because he thought her crying and freaking out over a ring was a little like over the top for something so small. So he thought maybe she was a little drunk. And he also identified the man in the station wagon as Jimmy when shown a photo lineup. He picked out Jimmy's photo. And I believe the photos of Carol and Jimmy that this man were shown were from the time that she disappeared, like the 80s. The cousin, while reiterating everything, said that he thought this ring incident in the parking lot happened at like 6 or 7 p.m. during the summer. But I believe the other man testified like, no, that's completely wrong. It was certainly in December. I remember specifically and it was around like 1 a.m. So I think there was just a little bit of inconsistency there just because it had been almost 30 years, right? Hiram, the neighbor, also testified to what he saw remember he was one that saw Jimmy scrubbing out the back of his station wagon. Carol's mother, Joy, also testified, again, kind of referring back to the record of the 80s, saying like, look, man, events were fresher in my mind back then. You need to refer to the record. If it said, that's what I said, then that's what I said. Bank manager testified, all of Jimmy's friends and acquaintances, everyone we've talked about testified and pretty much reiterated what they had told authorities back in 1983. Authorities? Authorities back in 1983. Authorities with both Arizona and California police departments also testified. I think they even brought in like retired detectives and stuff who had originally worked the case to testify. They revealed that the blood was typed A on the brush hoe. I'm not sure if they ever like were able to identify who the blood belonged to. I think it was just typed. And I think it may have been this evidence that helped them op reopen the cold case up. Like that seemed to be like some bombshell evidence that they didn't have in the 80s. Brenda, remember Brenda Moffat was supposed to come and testify? She was the neighbor who witnessed the road flare incident. However, on the day she had been subpoenaed to testify, she became ill, so she wasn't able to. And she then alerted authorities that she received a phone call after this by someone identifying themselves as Jimmy, who said it was good she didn't show up to testify. And she made the right decision, quote, playing sick, and then just hung up on her. And then on July 23rd, a Barstow Superior Court judge, R. Glenn Yabuno, ended up ruling that there was now enough evidence to bring Jimmy to trial. At his trial, which took place in December of 2011, the prosecution led by Deputy District Attorney John Thomas pretty much brought forth everything we've discussed thus far. And I believe, yeah, the, the presence and typing of that blood on the uh, brush
show handle was an integral part of their case. The only evidence brought forth by the defense, which was led by public defender Edward Cox, was the testimony of a woman who was actually a really good friend of Jimmy and an acquaintance of Carol's. And she testified that on December 23rd, 1982, around 8 p.m., Carol, who had been drinking, not sure how she knew that. And a man who was not Jimmy came into the bar where she bartended and picked up a pizza they had ordered. Now, this woman testified that she had come forward back in 1983 with this information, describing in detail the man that she had seen Carol with, whom she had never before seen with anyone other than Jimmy. And a Mojave County Sheriff did testify that this woman did come to him with a description of this man, and they were able to make a composite sketch. However, her testimony kind of fell apart when, you know, the prosecutor was like, that's kind of weird that you can remember this exact date and time almost almost 30 years prior, you know, December 23rd, what did you do the day after that, December 24th? What about the day before that, December 22nd? And of course, the woman couldn't think of anything. So that was kind of, I think, the prosecution like, you certainly have some intricate detail for something that happened like, you know, almost 30 years ago, but you can't have, you don't have any other details from any other days around that time period. So I think that kind of made her whole testimony fall apart a little bit. And on December 19th, 2011, a jury convicted Jimmy of all charges, and he was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. This case was the oldest case that had ever been brought to trial by the San Bernardino County Cold Case Unit. This was like the oldest case they had worked that had come to trial. Joy was able to finally get some closure and she said after the verdict, quote, at last we have a measure of justice for the loss of our beloved daughter and sister. Catherine, Carol's sister, said, quote, I certainly want to see him spend the rest of his life in jail. That's for sure. I just want him to know that people cared and still do care. I don't want him thinking that he got away with it. She said she and her whole family were just ecstatic and over the moon when authorities came to them in 2009 and 2010 saying like, hey, we've got new evidence and we're reworking this case and we're going to bring Jimmy to trial. She said, quote, my initial reaction, and I think everyone's initial reaction was, that's wonderful news, but it changes nothing for Carol. It's a wound that never completely heals. Gets you thinking about some pretty sad stuff. She said that in retrospect, she was also kind of haunted by like the last letter or two she had received from her sister. Um, So though Catherine was only 11 when her sister disappeared and her sister was older than her, they still had a pretty close bond, even when her sister was out traveling the country, and they would often communicate. Catherine said, quote, she sent us this pin box full of self-addressed envelopes so that we would write more. We were pretty close, but I don't think anybody knew much about who Jimmy Joe was. I don't think my parents knew how abusive he was. And it wasn't long after Carol had sent these self-addressed envelopes that Catherine said she'd received a letter from her sister that she just kind of thought maybe her sister was a little sad and depressed. She said, quote, that was in December 1982. In retrospect, you realize that's what it was. She just had regrets and stuff like that, but it was within weeks of her disappearance. Something about now that it's too late, I wish I were a better sister and a better daughter. She was a great sister and she apologized to her mother. She took five dollars from her one time and it really bothered her that she had done that. I've thought of that many times. If she was frightened, I think people who are in a situation with an abuser are isolated more and more and obviously they have control over them. But she said eventually she had to stop playing like the what ifs in her mind, you know. Quote, after a while, you have to stop your mind from going there because you wonder what she went through and it just becomes unbearable. Now, in his appeal, Jimmy tried to argue that the information about the partial fingerprint on the fold of the bag that Carol's head was found in should have been heard by the jury. The jury did not even hear that this evidence. And that is because in a hearing leading up to the trial, you know how they like go over all the evidence that's going to be introduced and then the judge says whether that's admissible or inadmissible. Well, at this hearing, the judge ruled that this, you know, fingerprint information couldn't be heard because A, the fingerprint examiner who had done that was dead. And and because there was no like official report documented this or whatever, it would just be constituted as hearsay. Jimmy's appeal was ultimately denied in May of 2013 with the court, you know, citing, yeah, like, yeah, the reason that the fingerprint wasn't used was because there was no official report from that deceased examiner that everything she told detectives of what she had found was hearsay. Like the detectives could say like, oh yeah, this examiner said this to me, but that's hearsay. And furthermore, one of the detectives who had testified at the preliminary hearing said that this fingerprint examiner told him she wasn't even sure how identifiable this print was because it was so partial. So they were saying like, that's why the fingerprint didn't match to Jimmy is because it was partial. It couldn't like be identified because Jimmy was really harping on this particular aspect. He wanted the jury to know that a fingerprint was found on the bag. It had been matched against all of the officer
sisters involved and and Jimmy, and it didn't come back as a match to either of them, to any of them. But yeah, the court was saying, was like, yeah, dude, it didn't come back as a match to anyone because there wasn't enough there to identify it with. According to an examiner with Cal ID, quote, the prints back then could have been possibly used for comparison. However, the standards of today rule that the fingerprint that was found on the bag is no longer suitable for comparison. It couldn't have been compared back then. There were not enough suitable ridges to have made a determination. You couldn't rule anybody in or out based on that fingerprint. It's not a degradation issue. It's just a lack of sufficient ridges to compare. So this fingerprint here, like that was the the main evidence that Jimmy had brought up in his appeal and arguing that the, that fingerprint evidence should have been heard. But yeah, because of everything I just went over, the court was like, yeah, no, bro. And I found one source who I will mention in just a moment that stated Jimmy actually died behind bars from cancer on July 7th, 2015. I just found it odd. I couldn't find like anything talking about that. I just found this this one source, which again, I'll get into in a moment, that said that he was dead. But this was such like a, a small local case. Maybe his death wouldn't make the papers or anything. You know what I mean? I couldn't find a, um, a find a grave match for him either. The source also said that Jimmy died supposedly admitting to nine other murders, including the murder of Nikki Bunch, who we actually went over in the William Floyd Zamastil video that I did. He is suspected of killing her. Her murder has never been solved. And supposedly, according to this source... Again, I will get into it in a moment. Jimmy died on his deathbed admitting to nine murders, including Nikki's. So I, I don't know... I don't know what to think about that. And it looks like there does seem to be d debate on whether it was William or Jimmy who had killed Nikki. Apparently there is some like conflict in the local community of who did that. Oh, and also Nikki was a resident of Needles. Forgot to mention that. So... Let's get into one other person real quick before we wrap up this case, Patrick Wayne Mello. And he disappeared on July 28th, 1995, when he was just shy of 14 years old. He was last seen in his home in Neils. So initially, police treated his disappearance as a runaway, and they claimed that there were sightings of him in Laughlin, Nevada, after he, he was reported missing. Several days after he was reported missing, authorities found a duffel bag behind a casino, and this was in Mojave Valley, Arizona. And they thought it was Patrick's at first, but I guess it turned out to be Patrick's little brothers. And all the information this source said was that Patrick's brother had left it there before Patrick had disappeared. And I'm not exactly sure what that means. Like, why would you, you just leave a duffel bag behind a casino? I, I don't know. That's just what the source said. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm bringing up Patrick's disappearance. Well, it just so happens Patrick was Jimmy's stepson. And Patrick was living with Jimmy when he disappeared in Needles, California. And I'm not sure if it was Jimmy's conviction or what, but authorities now believe that Patrick was not a runaway that there was foul play involved in his disappearance. So I stumbled upon a blog written by a woman who's from Needles, California, and she lives in Mojave Valley, Arizona, so not far from where she grew up. That This is the source that said that Jimmy had died and died admitting to nine murders, including Nikki's. So she goes by Rose Writes All Day, so I'm just going to call her Rose. So she has this blog. All right. And she was, I, I stumbled upon this when I was searching the Jimmy Joe Cox story, all right? So this popped up and she was talking about some true crime cases in the Needles area in a blog that she was doing, including some like infamous one in Needles where three people died. And the house they were killed in was referred to as, quote, the house of three murders in the in like the local community. And it was a pretty infamous landmark, you know, among the locals and of course served as like the party hangout for teens and stuff. The home was eventually like bulldozed and destroyed. So I think it was just kind of like the foundation that was left there. So she was researching the story for her blog, and I think she had a book that she was writing about it too or something. But she was writing about this when this like horrible murder-suicide happened across the street from her. And so shaken up about this and just like, oh my god, I'm reading about like this murder and like this, this murder happened right across my street. She talked to a, a good friend who still lived in Needles. Just kind of like talking about like how, how this could have happened. Like, can you believe this happened in like our small community and whatnot? And this brought up the topic of Jimmy. Her friend asked her if she had ever heard of Jimmy Joe Cox. And this friend told Rose, quote, the town was divided over whether he killed his girlfriend or not. It was a topic nobody cared to talk about. He came from a fine family and didn't have a criminal record. It was scary knowing someone that lived here for years could be a murderer. Whenever I saw him in his yellow dune buggy, I turned a corner. And whenever I saw him at the grocery store, I went down a different aisle. He was just that creepy to me. Now this, you know, piqued Rose's interest. And so this, she then went to like a Facebook group slash page called Memories of Needles Past and Present. And she made a post on there asking like, hey, does anyone know or have any information about this Jimmy Joe Cox? Like, you know, let me know what you know. And I wanted to read some of the responses she got because it certainly gives a little bit more insight into 
And to Jimmy, certainly how the residents viewed him. So there was a Needles resident who responded. He was a dispatcher in the early 80s. And he said, like most young people, he went to the House of Three Murders to, you know, hang out and drink some beer, beer with some friends. At that point, the house was destroyed. The foundation was just there. Now, this person claimed that Jimmy also arrived there with some friends of his. And they proceeded to light candles in like a circular, like weird pattern on a large piece of concrete where the foundation of the house was. And Jimmy and his friends then, quote, performed some satanic rituals. Um, and this person said he and his friends were kind of weirded out. Like, I'm not, he didn't really go into detail what exactly Jimmy and his friends were doing besides lighting candles. I don't know if they were chanting. I don't know if they were in robes. I don't know. All this guy said was he and his friends were just weirded out what they were doing and were re really weirded out because it seemed like Jimmy and his friends just didn't care if anyone saw what they were doing. They were just like nonchalant, like they were doing, you know, just having a picnic or something. Again, satanic panic was all the rage in the 80s, but especially in this area due to some gruesome like murders and sexual assaults and dismemberments. Um, so who knows if this is exactly what this guy witnessed, but that that's what he perceived it to be. Another message answered Rose's post with, quote, he's a piece of shit. Why would you keep his name alive? This message was from someone who said that they were a cousin of Patrick's and they went on, quote, that SOB killed him. I know he did. We tried to get him to admit to it, but he sat in a blank fucking stare. He took that shit to the grave. And that's what made me think like, oh, I guess he really did die then. This person said that Jimmy had been married into her family for quite some time, like for years. And it was a known fact that Jimmy was mean and abusive to Patrick. And when Rose, you know, pressed this person further, like, oh, explain to me more about Jimmy. Who was he? This person responded with, quote, okay, so he had bars on the kids' windows only. The doors were locked from the outside at 6 p.m. every night. We were not allowed out of the room. He locked the fridge and the cupboards so we couldn't eat. He had a toilet in his bathroom made out of drugs. There's so much. I don't want to put it all in text. So I thought that was, that was interesting, right? Like abusive prick. I mean, kind of is in line with everything we know about Jimmy, right? Another person answered Rose's post with, quote, he had some pretty evil friends. He sold his girlfriends like property and he even had orgies in his backyard. I think people were just afraid to say anything for fear of their own lives. Needles just didn't feel like needles anymore. It was a real scary time. So again, interesting. Um, I don't know about the orgy thing, who knows, but it's just kind of interesting that these were like residents' perceptions of Jimmy. And these were people who lived in the area when Jimmy lived in the area, you know? And another commenter commented on Rose's blog on July 4th, 2022, which is what I read to get all this last information about Patrick and stuff was Rose's blog. And this person claimed to be Patrick's sister. And she said, quote, I'm Patrick Mello's sister. I lived with my mother and Jimmy Joe Cox for a couple years just before my brother's disappearance. Yes, Jimmy Joe was a scary man, to say the least. I know a lot about what did or didn't happen while living there. So if you want to know the truth as it really was, my email is, and then she gave her email to Rose. And yeah, that's about it. I know Rose was like writing some kind of book. Um, I think the title was like When Pigs Fly or something. I need to look a little more into it because again, these comments were not too long ago, just last year in 2022. So I don't know if Rose like put out her book or anything, but yeah, it seemed like Rose was going to email Patrick's sister and get some more information. So I didn't definitely want to be on the lookout for Rose's book. I'm going to go to her website and see if maybe she had written it already because I just thought it was very interesting that I stumbled upon this blog and there were these people that were from Needles that, you know, knew these people that were related to Patrick and I just thought it was super interesting. And that is where I'll end it. And I will also ask, what do you guys think? So what do you think? Did Jimmy murder and dismember Carol? Did he murder his stepson? I'm super curious to know what you guys think. I honestly don't know what to think. Like, it's just hard because we don't even know how Carol died, right? So I don't know what to think. Like, it, it's just hard for me to have an opinion because we don't even know how Carol died, right? We have no information. But if we're to go off of, you know, Jimmy's own friends and neighbors, people who witnessed this, I mean, I don't know. I think the police got the right guy. Um, what do you guys think? Could Jimmy have murdered other people? That's what I always wonder. When people murder one person, like, I know sometimes that can happen, right? Where they just murder one person because it's like their lover or spouse or whatever. You know what I mean? And it's like, do they, could they kill again? Is it a one and done thing? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he was the type of killer that just killed people like that pissed him off. I don't know. Like if he killed a stepson, he disappeared in 95. So that means, you know, Carol had been found over 10 years before. And if he thought he got away with it, would he do it again? I don't know. What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Could he have been a serial killer? Yeah, I don't know. This case definitely... 
had me stumped and it's just so bizarre. Isn't it weird they haven't found anything of Carol? Isn't that bizarre, guys? Like, what do you think? Like, and like, what do you think of the head being found not far from where the, the hand was? Like, could Jimmy have put the head in the river later? Wasn't that weird what he told Detective Johnson about like, oh yeah, I bet you whoever put her, her remains in the river was just trying to shock someone and I don't know. I don't know. Where is Carol's body? Is it in the desert somewhere? Did the rest of it get lost in the river? I don't know, man. And where's Patrick? It's... I don't know, so many questions. And with the asshole dead, who knows if we'll ever get answers to those questions, right? Thank you so much to Certified Rodess for sending this case my way. I think that's definitely one of the reasons there's so many questions with this case is that, yeah, it happened in a small town in the 80s, you know, small town resources and stuff happened in, you know, a small town, so it didn't get a lot of like, you know, statewide or nationwide attention or anything. And I don't know, maybe someday we'll, we'll get an answer. You just never know, right? You never know. I mean, at least he was convicted. It sucks that he only, you know, had to spend, what, like four or five years in prison and he got to live his whole life out there free. That really sucks, but at least he died a convicted murderer. And I hope it was a very painful cancer. I hope he had a miserable experience when he died because honestly, the guy sounds and also looks like kind of an asshole. And, and come on, dude, like, I know you got to take it a grain of salt when people say stuff, right? With people's words. But come on, dude, you've got his friends, his acquaintances, his own family saying the same things about him, that he was an asshole, didn't treat women right, and was just a scary, weird, creepy dude. So I don't know. Please tell me your thoughts about this. I know I'm not answering comments, but I swear I do read them. And I promise I will catch up on them. I promise. I just, oh, we need more time in the day. <laughs> Alrighty, well, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off because I think my idiot neighbors are getting ready to party it up. I can hear the starting up. So I will let y'all go until next week. I hope you stay safe and happy out there. Remember, don't be a prick. Don't be like Jimmy here, dude. Don't be an insufferable asshole, you know? I actually saw this on a license plate frame the other day, and it's like, leave a little sparkle wherever you go. That's exactly what you should do. Leave a little sparkle wherever you go, all right? It is much needed today. No one no one needs you to be an asshole. You know what I mean? Alrighty, that will do it this week for Crime Dive. I will see you next week. Bye-bye.